Okay. Good evening, everyone. We are back with the Straza Lecture Series. Our guest tonight is Rob Renickers. Did I get that right? Or is it Runakis? Okay. okay. Wanted to maybe try the Spanish on that. Uh, so Rob is the founder of the Renaissance Sword Club. And his main passions are for sword disciplines, with emphasis on forms found mainly in early modern France. The main historical masters he studies are Pedro de Heredia, uh, Girolamo Cavalcabo, and Francois Dancy. He's translated a number of French treatises, including Livre de la Sons, uh, attributed to Pedro de Heredia uh, in the early to mid 17th century. Uh, Les Bay de Combat, uh, Dancy in 1623, and the uh, Trata o Instruction por Tirar las Armas. French isn't that good, sorry. Um, that's by Cabo Cabo, 1595, and Le Master d'Armes Liberal, Bernard, in 1633. So Rob is currently studying for his PhD at Winchester University, his thesis titled Fencing Instruction and Practice in the Court of the Dauphin Beyond, the Influence of the Bolognese Fencer, Girolamo Cabo Cabo. He's been active on the international tournament scene, both as a competitor and organizer, However, his main passion remains teaching, and he regularly gives workshops and lectures at martial arts conferences and conventions in Europe and the United States. So, Rob, it's uh, great to have you here and joining us. Why don't you um, take it away? Well, thank you very much. Good evening, everyone, uh, or good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, firstly, my compliments for continuing to get Europeans up at a ridiculous hour of the morning. I think that's a uh, Always a good thing to see, um, though in Tom Pway's case, probably several hours before he goes to bed. Um, so what we're going to do today is, um, is we're going to talk about the Book of Lessons. So we're going to talk about the treatise itself. And we're also going to talk about tackling primary sources. Um, and I'm going to, going to discuss some of my experiences in this, uh, some of the pitfalls. And I hope it's of interest at any rate. So the first thing I'm going to do is remove my face, which I think is a benefit for all. And I shall put on this PowerPoint presentation. Uh, can you just uh, confirm that you can all see this? Yeah, we can see it. OK. All right, then. So the Book of Lessons, the story of the Book of Lessons, I feel, is not really about a single treatise or indeed about a single fencer. I think that in historical fencing, we do tend to consider fencing by an individual who is producing some form of written text or by we try and find a specific style or a, or a tradition. And the Book of Lessons throws up a few things which uh, may, may cause us to have pause on that. Well, first of all, what is the Book of Lessons? Well, it's a text of 210 pages, very neatly written in uh, a very tidy hand. I wouldn't say it's a scribe's hand because it's far too neat for anyone who's actually written, uh, read any uh, scribe hands. With it comes 54 hand-drawn and coloured pictures. And the, the, those two books are found in the Scott Collection in Glasgow, in Scotland. And on top of that, there is an associated book of 71 pictures that's found in the Swedish Royal Library. Now, the pictures we're going to see throughout this evening are the, uh, from the Swedish Royal Library. Um, just for your knowledge, all of the ones that are found in the Scott Collection in Scotland are derived from those in the Swedish Collection. But shout out if I'm uh, if you need any clarification on that okay well the book of lessons has been ascribed to early to mid 17th century but actually the journey of the book of lessons begins in the 16th century with this treatise um, the treatise by Girolamo uh, Cavalcabo um, a fencer from Bologna who was translated in 1595 by a guy called Jacques de Villemont. And with it, there is also a second part to this treatise, which is by Paternostria of Rome. These two are very famous fencers of their time. 
They're mentioned by Montaigne uh, in his travel diary, and they're also mentioned in Branton's memoirs. Um, if anyone reads Branton on dueling, quite a famous guy, a uh, little bit salacious, so good, good clean fun as well from the early 17th century. But the mention being the 16th century. Um, François Dancy as well, uh, we mentioned earlier in his treatise of um, uh, 1623, um, mentions them as well. Um, and they're also mentioned elsewhere. So they're, they're, at the time, they are very, very well-known fences. Now, these two treatises appear in part at the beginning of the Book of Lessons. Um, something of a rework. They're, in, in times, in places, they are actually quoted verbatim. In other times, there's something of a rehash, they're reworked with additional commentary put in right at the beginning of this, this text that I'm talking about. Um, why is this important? Well, what we're seeing here is that within this treatise, we've already got someone dabbling, dipping rather, into other fences. They're drawing, they're beginning their work off with using part of these texts. So we're seeing someone who's not writing, whoever this author is of the Book of Lessons, they're not writing their own stuff per se. They're drawing on something really quite important to them. So this is quite useful. This gives us, um, I talked to us about the, the date for this book as being early to mid 17th century. We can actually say that the beginning of the work must be no earlier than 1595 when this is first published in Paris. Uh, we know it can't be um, any earlier because whilst we do have a manuscript for Girolamo Cavalcabo, which is earlier than this, we don't have one for Pater Nostria and we only see the two texts together published in 1595 in France, in Paris, as I say. Okay, so moving on, this is very interesting to actually look at um, here from my, my perspective, in that um, Girolamo Cavalcavo, he's very famous at his time, uh, his son goes on to teach the Dauphin, who becomes Louis the Thirteenth, and he's something of an influence uh, on other fencers. One assumes he's probably the most republished text before you get to uh, the the main text of the seventeenth century. People like uh, Salvatore Fabris, um, and of course all the the uh, Spanish texts. And what's he, what's interesting for me when it comes to the Book of Lessons is that. The Book of Lessons is drawing on Cabalcabo in an interpretation. If you see the bottom right, we've got some of the, the wonderful pictures that we see from Cabalcabo. And this is, um, sorry, uh, from uh, the Book of Lessons. And here we've got the four basic guards. And the guards are a grip and standard. They're going one, two, three, four. And on the top left, you've got the German translation of Cabalcabo, uh, published in 1611. Guards, one, two, three, four. And you can see the postures are different. Now, Cavalcabo is a rather brief text and it's left open to the, the fencer to infer what they can from this. But it just goes to show that different traditions, different fencers drawing on earlier texts can have their own interpretations. And it doesn't mean that anything is wrong, it is an interpretation. But when we think about our own time, we have a lot of arguments, as we see, particularly if we go to Facebook and other jolly places, where uh, people come along with what is the absolute right uh, interpretation of things. And one thing I'm going to posit here is, well, no, you have an interpretation and they're not necessarily right. It's down to what you want to derive from those earlier sources. So just pause on this guy. These earlier sources, therefore, I think it, um, uh, it comes into an interesting discussion, potentially. What is the purpose of a fight book then? What is the purpose of, the, of the, these sources? And I've already alluded to the fact that we tend to see these things as a nodal point in time whereby an individual is putting forward a set theory derived maybe over a series of, of years, but nonetheless, you are positing 
that particular theory. So I've been warned not to mention Pacheco in a particular bad way, but let's talk about uh, Pacheco versus Carranza. Obviously, you have the two schools start to argue about what's right and what's wrong. And we could, we could perhaps say that we have individuals today who are also taking a particular text and saying what's right and what's wrong. What we've got at this in the book of lessons, this handwritten text, is a large part of the beginning is dedicated to earlier fences, but they're reworking it. So they're deriving something and they're producing something new. We could compare with, say, um, Saviolo in 1595, who talks about drawing from different masters. The people at the time, the fences at the time, are undergoing a personal journey. They're meeting other fences, they're experiencing things, they're experimenting. Fabris, we've talked about, he travels around Europe um, and he obviously experiences different fences in that time. So the experience is not really that the book is not the whole of the experience, it's an output. And people are drawing on these things, synthesizing, and often re reinterpreting and churning these things out. And if we look at some of these books, so I've mentioned Cabal Cabo, and obviously I'm a little bit obsessed by him. He gets reprinted again in 1666. So that's, you know, 70 odd years after the French translation comes out. These texts are being reused, reinterpreted, reapplied, probably with different types of swords as well. So we can't really, we've, we've got to get away from, in my opinion, this idea that we are looking at a, a snapshot in time. The book in its way is, is something of a journey. Okay, so let's, let's look at who the potential author is. Now, we have some funny games when it comes to who this author is. We, we do uh, have this um, idea that is, is Pedro de Jerez, uh, captain of horse and governor of Brabant. So in the Low Countries, in the Spanish Netherlands, and he was there in the early part of the 17th century. And we know this by a librarian's note of 1900 on the inside cover. There is no other evidence for authorship. And this gives us a rather interesting problem is, well, do we actually believe them? Now, one, one person who shall remain nameless did say that we should believe the librarian's notes because librarians know things. Now, they absolutely do know things and they're wonderful people, but we do have to go back to an original um, source citation that we can actually say, okay, this is definitely the author. We've got no reference, I say, to authorship in the text. And indeed, the title, Livre de Lessons, is actually derived from the pictures. The pictures refers to the text as Livre de Lessons. The text has no reference to it at all. And our dear librarian refers to it, in fact, as Tite d'Arms, a tree ties of arms. So we have some problems when it comes to authorship and indeed titling. However, of course, secondary, um, sorry, modern historians, they're going to take uh, what they can, Sidney Anglo follows that it should be called the trade to arms, and he calls it a Spanish text throughout. Uh, we've got Laguina in his fantastic uh, bibliog bibliography of uh, all of the, the various um, fencing texts. Uh, he, he calls it a 16th century text, and he believes, uh, I think, that it's in fact this chap, another Pedro de Heracia, um, who died, according to my notes, in 1554, before the first part of the Book of Lessons was written. However, these things, our 19th century friends, of course, have an influence on us, and these things come through. However, we do have some heroes in this. Um, I'm going to call out a chap called Matt Gallus uh, as a, a bit of a hero, and he's done some research on what we think is our, our modern Pedro de Rethia. Excuse me, I'm just going to take a sip. So we do know that there was a Pedro de Rethia as a captain of uh, cavalry in the 1620s in the Low Countries, and um, he was governor of uh, Zotlo. So my pronunciation is probably um, up there with, with yours, Eric. I do apologise. Um, there's also a reference to another Pedro de Rethia who uh, served in Ireland. Uh, was actually um, besieged and escaped, but was then captured again, and he spent some time in prison. Um, 
before being um, uh, released by the English. I'd actually found a letter from him uh, to uh, Lord Carew um, asking for support because he was later re-imprisoned in Ghent, um, apparently for his part in the debacle in Ireland. However, it's unlikely to be the same as our governor of Pedro de Rethia, because this one was a sergeant. So I hope I'm not losing you, but our problem is, is we've got an awful lot of Pedro de Jerezias. And in fact, if you Google Pedro de Jerezia, it's quite a common name. So we've got no author, we've got no dedication, we have no poetry in the beginning, as we do in so many of the texts of the period. And we've only we've got a starting date that we can infer. So what is it, what does this text actually have in it? Well, we've got our beginning part with Cabo and we have our little bit of Passamastria. Now those are kind of almost aphorisms. They're general statements of use for fencing. Then the book goes into quite a classic form of text. It's got the single sword, sword and dagger, sword and cape, etc. And we're gonna, we're gonna have a look at some of the lovely pictures um, from that but they are very much lessons. They're very much um, giving a, if someone does this, you should do this. And here is a variation. Here is a variation. Here is a variation. We don't have something that we see in the noble distress of text where we're starting to see a philosophy and a more general set of um, understanding and theory running through. What we have is a set of lessons from which we have to infer more general principles. It does seem to be building on Caval Cabo, and I would argue it's along the lines of what Tom talked about in his lecture, what we might call the common fencing. It's not codified or philosophized to the state of noble distreza. It is not um, what we were going to see with the great Italian fencers, such as Fabris, um, Capoferro, those, those people. We're seeing something in what we'll look at in a second in very much an upright type of standard fencing that we've seen before in perhaps people like Saviolo, perhaps with the Bolognese fences like Dalagocchio, you know, that sort of form. All right. Now let's dive into some of the pictures because the pictures are hopefully going to illustrate what I'm talking about and probably be a lot more engaging. Um, this is uh, the hand of Hans Jordlind, who very kindly managed to get the uh, copy of the pictures from the Swedish Royal Library uh, for us to publish. Um, I forgot to measure his thumb, so I'm afraid I cannot give you an accurate scale, but it is folio. What we see in these pictures um, here, you can see, uh, um, are the style and clothing of later than 1600. You see the rough is disappearing, we've got open neck collar. We have a short truncated um, jerkin, if you want to call it like that. Um, so we don't have the more angular tabarding. You've got the puffed um, trousers, uh, sorry, or breeches, I do apologize, that you see in the low countries at this time. And we have an awful lot of color. Running through the text, um, and I'll just run through some of these. You're going to get to see some pictures um, fairly quickly. We can come back to them and then we'll, we'll go, um, then we'll see some other pictures and talk about what's going on in more detail. So we've got the single sword. Um, I tend to rave about the colors here. And I would also point out, you've got a lot of faint lines. The artist here has drawn and corrected quite a lot. And I wanna come back to that later because that's very interesting. Um, I'm just going to move this rather annoying WebEx box, so hopefully uh, that's not covering you. Um, we've got some um, interesting hairstyles. Some of the hairstyles actually uh, is a little bit along the lines of Fabris and slightly later, this upward flick that we see here, some nicely trimmed moustaches and beards. Um, and you also see some rather curious expressions. Um, I've just seen something come up about the, um, the, 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 so the socks, the stockings, I love the fact that they're multicolored. Um, this, this is something that I always get excited about. Notice the script underneath in, in this, uh, in the Swedish Royal Library, 
the text, which is all in French. I haven't mentioned yet that, uh, that's bad of me. Um, quite difficult to read there. In the later pictures, slightly clearer. But this is a folio edition, so I think this is something that in my interpretation could be stood up in a classroom and can be viewed. It's, it's not something one would have on your lap. Interestingly, the Caval Caval original was tiny. It was a little pocketbook, little reference guide. So we have the single sword, we have the sword and dagger as well. Sword and cape. A little bit of grappling, and here's you, you see a slightly disappointed face on both of them um, as one person is being toppled. And then we've got this, this anti-dagger technique, specifically anti-dagger. It is not about fighting with the dagger. Okay, so let's talk about the single sword. One of the first things that interests me is the stance. Um, it's either linear or it's in a three quarter form. The Book of Lessons tends to talk about it in a somewhat linear way. I wouldn't leap into thinking of it into um, more of an Italian form or anything like that, but it is quite upright. You see the hips of the gentleman on the left slightly squared there's a lot of that so i think it's it um, has uh, a lot to do with the common fencing of the time uh, again i don't know if you can see the shadow on the left there but the the fencer has been moved inwards and it does seem that there's an awful lot of corrections uh, that are going on here so i think this is active engagement of the artist with someone who's correcting the fencing and i'll give more detail to that later The hand position is very interesting. Um, you'll see here that the sword has a ring on it in the later pictures. Unfortunately, I'm not able to show you the pictures from the Scott collection um, because there's publication issues with this. We've got permission, however, from the Swedish Royal Library. The one from the Scott collection has a ring on either side. I wouldn't infer too much on the sword itself. The detailing of the fingers however, is very, very clear. So I think it's, it's more to do with the finger and the hand position that we're actually looking at, rather than seeing a representation of any particular sword type. Having said that, the hand position for our fencer in the Book of Lessons is always behind the guard. When they are non-Book um, of Lessons people, as we're going to see in a second, they have the finger across the cross piece. And here's a good example. So Tom talks about fighting against the mathematical form. The book of lessons in the single sword, after going through a lot of quite standard stuff about, you know, this is how you would do an attack. This is how you would defend against an attack. Um, it then talks about how to counter the mathematical form. And notice here that our gentleman in, in gorgeous blue on the right has got his finger through um, the, the, the cross piece there and over, whereas the gentleman on the left does not. His thumb is on the top. Um, I do wonder, I don't really have an awful lot of evidence, how much this thumb uh, on the top starts to influence some of the, or is, or is a, a preview of later fencing techniques where the grip changes to have that thumb on top. So just a, um, a picture here, so you can just see a little bit clearer um, that the finger is going through here. You've got four plates of this showing the mathematical form. Going to sword and dagger. I'll just flip over on my notes. Here you can see body a little more squared here, particularly with um, the gentleman on the left where he's got his dagger advanced there. Notice the grip is the same. Um, and he's, there's an awful lot of having the sword by the hip withdrawn whilst the dagger is forward. Notice also that I think there's a little bit of trouble here with the um, knees on the front leg. This is corrected in the later, um, the later plates. You see the knee is slightly more bent on that. We have a standard lunge here from the left, not very deep, of course. 
and uh, you see uh, quite quite a normal attack um, where you see the parry and the thrust straight down the line. There's a little bit of blood uh, on our on our chap who's receiving. This is actually quite important, and we'll look at that later. And then we have um, this. We have the dagger arm thrown back. This is very, very uh, interesting to me. We see this a lot later in Italian treatises. Let's have a look at them. I hope the audience will know uh, some of the pictures, at least on the bottom part. But um, if I have got my facts right, we're looking at Villa Dita, uh, 1670, uh, in the top left, um, so southern Italian. And then you have Marcelli, I think that's 1686, on the top right. And um, I could do a shout out, see if people know what the bottom left is. Silence, I think that's Ettenhart. And the bottom right is, yes, Rada. Okay, so the later Spaniard, uh, Spanish authors um, call this the Italian lunch. And it's very much where it's a linear form where the arm is thrown backwards for various reasons. It can, can be in time for a, um, uh, an evasion. So the arm is thrown back and it, you almost do something like a gerata, or it's also an extension. So it allows uh, the balance when you throw your arm forwards in a good lunge, you're profiled with the body, you're controlling your opponent solely with the sword. Interestingly, the earliest reference I have to this is actually French from François Doncy in 1623 and in this, in the Book of Lessons. I am not going to cause an international incident by saying it is therefore a French lunge. Um, however, it does come across there and the Spanish do see this much later as, a, um, as an Italian form. But we do also have this interpreted and I just lost the reference as a Volga Distreza form. Um, so um, I'm just desperately trying to find where this comes, uh, who actually says this. I don't have it, I do apologize. But it is mentioned um, in uh, the 18th century as a Volga form for Distreza. Then we've got this rather happy chap here. He's uh, doing Cape, um, as one can see. This is where we get some of the inconsistencies coming in between the pictures and the text, because we have this. We have the cape with the dagger and the sword. Nothing in the treatise talks about cape and dagger and sword. I ha have had a play with cape and dagger and sword, and I admit I'm, I'm but a student of the past rather than a uh, master, but it, it, it caused a bit of chaos. So. Um, I don't know why the daggers are included in this. Similarly, we've got two swords. Two swords don't appear in the text either, not at all. I have wondered for a, a while whether this was actually meant to be a frontispiece and perhaps there was some sort of heraldic device that was meant to go underneath this, because in the end, what we're dealing with here is what appears to be an unfinished set of plates, an unfinished text. However, it could equally be that the, um, the book itself was never fully finished. Moving on, we've got evidence of blood. Well, why is this important? Well, it's important because um, we're seeing quite something quite graphic here, and we do see in some of the, um, certainly the Italian texts with which I'm far more familiar, depictions of violence coming through to a conclusion. But all of these pictures are dropped in the later plates, uh, which uh, we see associated more closely with the text. There is in fact only one depiction of blood that makes it through into these later, into the later text. And it's this one, and interestingly in the, in the original picture here, there's no blood, but there's quite a lot of blood that's shown in the later text. And my theory for that is that this is basically what happens to assassins. 
Uh, we're dealing in a period, of course, where Henry IV of France is assassinated, 1610. Um, his predecessor is also assassinated, both of them by the dagger. And one wonders what the shock element was at this time about people of noble status suffering this, this particular fate. And this, this is um, on our, our last slide, but we can go back and look at uh, other slides again. Um, it's something where we really need to start considering how we interpret treatises, because treatises are, of course, a representation of the context, not just about the fencing. What we've got here is a treatise that's written in French. It has a whole collection of various different techniques, techniques that appear to be based on common fencing, derived from um, two Italians, one of whom ends up in France. And during this period, we've got regicide. We have a lot of shock that's going on. We have an awful lot of violence, um, naturally. And we need to consider what does this actually say about how the teaching is going across. Who's going to see this? Who's actually going to receive this? Someone who's writing this down and drawing lessons and drawing conclusions and developing on it, and they wanted to pass it on. We don't know if it's for publication. It could be a manuscript that's just to be presented. There's an awful lot of work and money has gone into the pictures. It could be that it's to teach a family or friends. And the pictures are large enough, as I say, that they can be done on, on display. But we have to recognise that, uh, as, as, as I've been saying, that a five book is, is not a didactic on its own. It is, in fact, an intermediary. Um, and if anyone's uh, at all um, aware of the, the work of Eric Burkhardt, who's a, a German academic who's been looking at, um, um, been looking at uh, uh, a lot of the German medieval texts, he said something that I, I think was, was absolutely brilliant was that um, the book is not done between, is not made to be read between absentees. It's between participants who are in there and the book is the third party. I think this is what this is for. I think this is basically a demonstrative, a useful uh, piece, uh, uh, a useful drawing, a useful picture that is meant to be displayed with someone explaining what's going on. And I think there is this wider context um, that you have the violence and this is what we want to show. We want to show that this is what you need to do to defeat the worst people assassins. And we're showing them bloodied and dying because they are inherently evil. Well, I think it's a really interesting position too that the, the books the time are are meant to be like as as a participant, not as an outsider. That's how a lot of traditions today deal with their their um, their texts or their books too, right? They they don't they don't hold them to some um, you know, extreme standard, right? It might be the norm that people refer back to, but but it's definitely um, sort of a an in family sort of thing, right? It's it's meant for the participants themselves, not outsiders. I, I think so. I think that there's various things that we, we really need to consider. I'm just going to go back a couple of slides um, to to really talk about um, some of this. So all all texts of prime you know all primary materials are flawed. Um, they are written by a flawed individual who has a certain understanding and they are themselves attempting to take often what is a you know a verbal tradition and place it down text we, we all know that but um if i can be challenging i think a lot of times we we tend to revere these texts and we should certainly um give them you know a lot of kudos a lot of credits and we should, but we should take care with them uh, we've mentioned pacheco i'm sure that we could argue that there are flaws in what he's doing. I, I fear there's a lot of um, zealotry and a lot of um, focus on individual texts. And what we've got here is this text, we've got these pictures that probably date to maybe the 1630s. We've got a text that, you know, as, we've, as, as I've gone at quite some length, um, draws on um, very, you know, quite earlier stuff. This is spreading maybe 40, 50 years. And it's an incomplete text. It's got an attempt 
to build on earlier material. It's got, um, for example, um, the Gallicization of certain Spanish terms. Um, it's got inconsistencies like everything else. It is flawed and it is going over a long period. It doesn't mean it's worthless. It just means that it has issues and we need to approach them as such. Uh, so I, I think we should never really try and look at these texts in isolation. I think we should look at them in, in context. Um, one of the things that interests me is, of course, if this is actually written in the area of Brussels, at the time you've got Marie de Medici's course in exile. And Marie de Medici, um, mother of Louis the Thirteenth, not really um, had didn't really have a very good um, relationship. She goes into um, exile in Brussels, has one of the most glittering courts of Europe in, in the 1630s. Um, is joined there by her other son, Gaston d'Orléans, and with him and with them, an awful lot of duelists, much to the delight of the Spanish authorities who are trying to keep control of um, the thing there. And it, it does strike me as, as rather odd that you've got a text that's written in French of the period that's showing an awful lot of this stuff when you've got all these things going on. Now, again, I can run off down the road and start inferring an awful lot of stuff there, but I think that would be really quite bad of me to do. What I have to do is just go, okay, this is what we know, this is what we can state, this is a, a potential uh, context. The other reason why it was perhaps written in French is that um, if it was for publication, being outside of France, you could uh, escape the, the king's restrictions on publication. So there might be just quite a standard low level reasoning for this. Okay, so that was um, a fairly rapid trot through the book of lessons. Um, I don't know if we want to open this up at all or perhaps focus in on, on anything in particular. Rob, I'm curious, um, as you look at it, could you talk more about uh, the specifics that you see in the, the book, uh, not just the the illustrations, but uh, where you see connections to, to uh, other other uh, uh, you know treatises or traditions um, that are going on. Do you see it as more Italian, or do you really see it as sort of a, a pan-European tradition that's being illustrated here, except you know with some little uh, specific callouts to something else? I think. I think um, this, um, haha, it's very difficult to say, I feel, what is a particular type of fencing? Well, why do I say that? We can say that according to certain authors. We can perhaps say there's a certain convention of styles such as the Bolognese, Mancellino, Morozzo are very close. I, I do get a little bit uncomfortable when we talk about Italian forms of fencing, because it, it can often be quite a heavy hammer to apply. What we have here, is, as, as I hope I've, I've tried to outline, is an upright stance. We're seeing not very deep lunging, but remembering that deep lunging, deep forms of attack seem to be coming in you see it somewhat in Agrippa, but you really start to see it, I suppose, from, from Capoferro, I guess, is, is the classic one we're seeing. We're not seeing that here. We do see an awful lot of techniques which are mentioned as vulgar de Threza. Um, for example, uh, some of the methods of breaking the guard, some of the ways of fighting in sword and dagger are really, um, uh, I understand from Tom and from Manel, they are very much, you, you hear from uh, Spanish and Portuguese authors, but it's a mishmash. It's a real mishmash of stuff. And what you seem to have is an individual or individuals who are attempting, as I say, to take this earlier, let's call it common form of fencing and uh, meld it with other things that they have perhaps come in uh, to contact with or with other treatises. Um, I would say it's going to look a lot more like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go out on a limb here, let's say 
something like Dallagocchio, something like Saviolo, certainly, um, I don't know if you know the 1595 club, um, but when I uh, chatted um, uh, with, with Chris from there about that, he's seen a lot of Cavalcabo in that. Um, when I talk about some of the, um, the, the vulgar distressor methods, there's occasionally you've got some of the spinning motions when they're coming in. So um, I think it's the, the torneada or something like that, where you see that coming in. Um, you also see some interesting things whereby one might parry with the sword, for example, on their sword. But if they charge you with their dagger to stab you, you have to punch their dagger with your sword hilt. Some real vulgar stuff you would certainly not see in gracing any of the noble distress um, there, but not really falling into what I would call some of the more complete Italian forms. I'm not sure whether that answers your question or I'm just being a historian saying more research is needed. <laughs> There's some things that definitely look Italian-esque. Yes. Me, like, um, like this, um, this plate, some other people have noticed it too. I mean, it, it could be, you know, essentially an incartata. It could be an incortada. Um, I think if I remember rightly on this one, it is actually a lunge. One of the, the reasons why I give pause on it for being an incortada is that um, uh, the author doesn't like it because you show your back. Um, there is a front foot gerata that comes in. Um, you know, there are some incortadas in there. I'm telling, I'm telling a slight fib, but it, it, there's, it's, there's some slight inconsistency about love towards it. Um, the other thing is there's an awful lot of counters to this. There's, an, there's a, a lot going through here on how to defeat this, um, this particular lunge. Um, so again, uh, I, I find it curious that something that will perhaps become, is seen later as a standard in, in things like Villa Dita, obviously that's quite a lot later, is, is countered a lot in this. I'd also say, I think the, because the discussion of the mathematical form, um, that's a very interesting phrase to me. Uh, why, why does it specifically say uh, the mathematical form? So again, I, 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 I honestly don't know. But it, I, I think um, this is where it comes uh, down to the fact that given the, the long extent of the treatise and given fencing is always a personal journey, um, I'm somewhat loath to apply a, a general label. Now, obviously we know that the English and the French talk about the Italians. The English talk about the Spanish in the way in which they fence. Um, uh, whether they themselves are talking about, you know, about having a national or a large geographical form is, is perhaps more problematic, but I am very happy to be stand, uh, stood corrected. Um, Tim Rivera wants to know if there are any pictures of pocket sand. Of, of what, sorry? <laughs> oh, pocket sand. Um, no, no, there's not. But uh, at the end of the book, uh, he does actually end up with it, um, saying, well, OK, if, um, if you have to fight uh, with, uh, the, the, with a dawn with a bright sun, then basically you can... Um, yeah, Tim, sorry, I, I just saw the comment come up. It was asked publicly. Um, have the sun behind you. But if it's on a windy day, make sure you have the sun. I think it's on your right. But have the wind behind you. Uh, and we're referring the dust goes in the face uh, of your opponent. And there's some little bits about how a short person can fight a taller person and basically making sure you try and take the higher ground. These little nuggets that just kind of are thrown in towards the end. Uh, it, it, it's really quite strange. It starts out as a book almost with this great intention of, OK, we've, we've got these masters from before. We're now going to derive and build on this. We have a little bit of problem in, in this gloss over the top. Um, and then it kind of peters out at the end. One thing I should mention is um, rather like a Caval Cabo, the, the guards, when it talks about the guards, it doesn't actually give the hand position on it. What it talks about, if I just come back here, is the arm position. Um, and that, that's really quite interesting uh, because what it actually, I'm uh, just 
flipping back here at speed back to our uh, back to our guards. Um, so it essentially says, okay, well the um, the first guard should the arm should be higher than the shoulder. Second guard should be at the shoulder. Third guard should be, I think it says down by the, the knee, and then the fourth guard should be somewhat to the inside. It talks about in hand position in the main text though, about having brocard and imbrocard. So knuckles up and knuckles down, uh, which I'm given to understand is, let, let's call it a more vulgar way of describing it. Certainly the only thing I, I've never seen that in any other French text. Uh, like that. I see Chris Lee's on, so maybe he can correct me on this. But that again perhaps indicates more of a of a vulgar uh, type of thing. There are also some uh, interesting mistakes I'm reminded of. Here we see our gentleman in fourth who's giving us all a wave. Generally uh, in the later plates, the plates that are associated with main text, I say, the derived from the Swedish ones, um, generally the hand is shown forward for our hero, for our standard book of lessons fencer. The baddies, so mathematical form and, and other ones, are either got their hand up to one side or they have it dropped down by the hip. So there, there does seem to be an attempt at some form of consistency, but again it, it's just a very, very um, unfinished work. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Great. We are getting some questions uh, in from the chat. Um, and this is a, a more of a technical question about the text. Um, I think speculation about maybe there's additional information on the pages. And uh, has anybody thought about x-raying these or using some other kind of technology to get a better image of what was there? Okay, um, it's, it's a good question because we do have some parts that are redacted, um, very heavily redacted. Um, we've also got some um, crossings out and corrections in there as a standard in, in a lot of manuscripts. Um, haven't tried to get them x-rayed or anything like that. We did discuss it. The, the, the problem is expense um, and whether the, the benefits would outweigh. It does, from what we can see, of the uh, pages, there is some slight transparency that we can see in the scans. And so I'm going to make an inference there's not really much that we can we can see that um, that isn't already there, basically. Thank you. So uh, we do have another question from the chat. Um, they'd like you to talk a little bit more about the prevalence or trends in drawing from different styles of fencing, sort of the amalgamation of theory um, back in the 17th century, and what would a real typical fencer in the 17th century be doing or be drawing from, in your opinion? You want me to tell you what a real 17th century fencer looks like? It's a tough uh, question. I thought that when I thought. Uh, I don't know, and I believe they're all dead, so I can't really ask them. Um, it's, 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 it's the standard thing about, you know, when someone says, I fence like so-and-so, no, uh, you, you've got an interpretation. I think what, what this shows me here is that um, you have a variety of forms. Now, the top left is a little bit Meyer-esque. Um, now, that's, that's a gross statement because, of course, Meyer's 1570s, isn't he? So this is way before this, which is 1611. But there is a Germanic tradition that is coming through here. Um, I would say in the, the other pictures that are associated with Cabal Cabot, um, they are slightly more upright. And uh, if I remember rightly, they're nudes as well. So they are pertaining to, to some of the, uh, the, the Italian um, tradition. I suppose it comes down to what we want to interpret as accuracy. Um, I think the artist here attempted accuracy. There are a lot of corrections. He's obviously appealing to a certain style. It's very colourful. They're, I mean, are they well-dressed? They're, they're 
they're fairly well dressed if one assumes from the expense of the inks that are being put in. But let's face it, if we look at some of the pictures in more detail, there's a certain rubberiness or elasticity in some of the arms. Um, so it's not in, so they, they seem to lack joints at particular times and they've got folds rather than elbows. So, you know, the, the, the accuracy of it is, is difficult to say. I approached the Victorian Albert Museum to try and get a date on the clothing. And the individual who responded said, no, no one ever dressed like this at the time. Uh, these are fake. Um, I was horrified. Uh, the, this, this was basically, oh God, I've got some sort of 19th century Victorian um, mashup. Um, I was lucky to know a, a few people in, in the Netherlands. And they said, no, this is how we dressed back in the day. Um, so, you know, we, we, we have to be very careful when, when we're talking to experts as well, I suppose. Um, again, I'm not sure I'm answering your question. Maybe I'm just going on a long evasion. Um, Rob, could you give us an um, example, uh, like walk us through what the text says on um, <clears throat> on a couple of these, um, so we can get a, a sense of how they present the plays um, verbally as well? Okay, so I'm going to attempt to read this. Um, I mean, I would say there is a rather wonderful translation of this um, by a somewhat graying um, author, if anyone fancies it, it's available from Fallen Rook Books. But anyway, um, so this is saying this figure demonstrates, um, I think it's saying the third guard um, that can be made um, something about the book of lessons. I need to actually look it up because it's too tricky for me to read at this hour. Um, but essentially, you've got someone who's approaching um, in the, the, the third guard. Um, so, I mean, this, this is really just demonstrating the gas. Let's actually have a, a look at the play. So a lot of the times here, what we're seeing is, you see they're quite high, quite high guards up here. So um, the arm is being lifted by the gentleman on the left to essentially to gain the sword of the gentleman on the right, who's in um, quite an extended guard as we can see. So a lot about the, the Book of Lessons is actually on controlling uh, the blade or breaking the guard of the opponent. And there's various things they talk about in going in to, to essentially you're breaking them so they, they do what you want them to do. So we see this um, continuing through. We see this in, in, in Cape as well. Notice again, he's, you know, he's going on the week of the sword here. Um, pretty much from the middle, going back towards the what we call uh, the forte, um, certainly in, in more Italian or French forms here. Um, I will skip on this one. Let's go back to some of the earlier ones. Right. Oh, let me go through. Sorry about this. Whizzing through, whizzing through, whizzing through, whizzing through. Okay, so to counter mathematical form, for example, he actually says, um, I think he's saying you should do this in second guard, but he's basically saying, you see someone coming in, they're, they're sticking their arm out at you. I'm doing the text a disservice here, by the way, um, by paraphrasing, and you cover it with uh, the, the strong of your sword, and then you can continue through and do it. The, um, it's interesting when I talk to Spanish fencers, to uh, a Nova Distreza, because their response is, oh, of course it wouldn't work, um, uh, because they do Nova Distreza and it, it, it is perfect. Um, you can counter that if you so desire. But they are, it is fairly basic um, approaches on that. In fact, I happen to have the translation here. Um, so if I can just um, flip in, we can actually have a look at some of the um, talks about how it talks about against the mathematical form. I'm sure this is making fascinating viewing as I flip through a book. I also have a question from somebody about this particular plate or, or related to it. Um, so 
if it's not going to be too distracting while you're flipping no. through the pages. Go for it. Um, in relation to the idea of the mathematical form, um, have you seen any connection uh, with Palladini or Monesi's idea of it being uh, fencing in the school with nice flat floors rather than, say, more rigorous uh, rough and tumble fencing? Hmm, that's actually quite an interesting question, um, it, and it, it, it goes into um, intent on the text. Um, it's a problem because the text is literally a book of lessons. So we're talking about inference. Um, there is the use of the term play a lot. It is difficult to understand whether it is play in a sal or play just as in a general term for a set of techniques. Um, I, don't, I don't think we can go into that detail to make that inference. Um, there is an awful lot of talk um, about um, basically defeating an opponent and coming over. They're quite rigorous um, in what they're talking about here. But to give you an example from um, the mathematical form, um, so this is the play of the single sword in mathematical form and immediately goes into the parries of said plays. So there's not really any introduction of it. And the first lesson is quite simply, if an enemy strikes you an estacard, like a thrust, to the outside, parry with your strong to his weak, going in fourth and stepping to the outside. And that, I believe, is this uh, plate. So he's, he's suggesting you step to the outside, suggesting you parry and push the blade over, which one might infer is quite distressing. But the text is so blunt that it doesn't really give us much more than that. Again, he says, being both in high guard, if the enemy strikes an S-guard, S-guard to the inside, under your guard, on the right side, you will parry with the strong of your sword to his weak, or letting your sword pass or fall below, fall below his in stepping to the inside. So he's countering with stepping and passing footwork, but it's up to the fencer to infer more from that. So it sounds like you really can't play this game without some fencing fundamentals that you bring with you. There's just not enough there. Yeah, I would say that assumed knowledge plays a major part. Again, that's very much like Caval Cabo in the beginning. You need to have a basic understanding. Uh, one of the interesting things about the translation of Cabal Cabo is it comes up with a new innovation for fencing, which is a glossary of terms. Um, and, you know, to, to, to have a glossary is, is really quite unusual at this time. And the Book of Lesson actually follows that by having some of the, the, this many dictionaries where there's glossary of terms there. But it does not go into massive detail. Even the, the section on what is measure, what is, um, uh, you know, what, what is meant by tempo, for example, very Italian terms, but again, really, really almost glib in some of the explanations on that. And again, it is, it is very difficult. So when, when we were doing the translation on this, there is, there is the use of the term volta occasionally, and that often can mean like a gerata or, or something like that, but it can also mean a term. And we have to be very careful when we were looking at this, that the context, were, and, and any translator, you, you, you know this better than me, Puck, is, you know, is faced by what does it mean in this specific instance? Um, it was very fortunate that the text is very clear in French, um, so one can do that, but we have these odd terms that are coming in and it never, it never gives us that full explanation that you get rewarded by in in something like the Pacheco works or you know Rada being the you know I mean Rada's par excellence of course but you just don't have that explanation. So again if I can refer you to that picture at the beginning about the guards, the book of lessons takes something, it derives an interpretation. One can only assume it works for whoever has been producing this. But you also have other people in other areas taking an interpretation and applying it to what they're doing. And um, again, when it comes to swords, 
we have a representation of a sword here. We don't know if that is actually what is being used for practice. Um, we might assume it's not what's being used in earnest, but um, one thing that interests me, for example, is sword weights. When we're talking about um, certain books, I, I often get people saying, you know, you can't use this particular sword with this treatise, it's just wrong. And I sometimes wonder, well, hold on, can you use a variety of different swords with this treatise? And what does that do to the mechanics and your interpretations? To a degree, a lot of it will be stuff and nonsense. You're just playing with it. You might be using the wrong thing. It's anachronistic, completely understood. But I do sometimes wonder, because, you know, um, Kabal Kabo, for example, has a, probably as much cutting as he does thrusting. Um, is he using a, a, a heavier sword? What happens when that text, which is being endlessly, well, not endlessly, but is being reprinted six times or so, translated into other languages, absorbed into other books, what swords they're using there? Are they use the, you know, are they using the same sword over forty years? I, I don't, I don't think so. And that has to impact how one is fencing. That's a very distressing way of looking at it. I would say. Um, I'm curious about the um, the glossary. Um, mm. So we glossaries are pretty heavily used in the Spanish texts. Um, and we see them going all the way back to Carranza, but have, but you're, you're studying actively right now for a PhD in this kind of um, academic pursuit. Have you seen um, much, do we know the history of the glossary in text uh, in the Renaissance? Um, yes, we do. And um, I don't have the author, but there's a history of thoughts that actually talks about this. And I can certainly forward that on. Um, we do see glossaries from the medieval period certainly. Um, they're not necessarily um, um, a, a, an early modern invention. Um, how widely they're used, I don't know. In fencing in my area, I see them from 1595. I see them as, as Villemont, um, the translator. And he was a very well-traveled man uh, actually, actually bringing this in. But again, you know, Caranza, I, um, I'll, I'll take your word on it, I'm not really au okay fait with the text. Um, what I would say though is um, we, we do see an abruptness that's brought through in the Book of Lessons um, with the glossary. It's very punchy. We don't see, we were talked a bit about um, any of the, the theories going through. We don't see any philosophy. So Karantz, of course, the great humanist, um, arguably contemporaneous with Vigiani, with Bologna, who also does a lot of philosophy in there. I know um, possibly not as, as, as eloquent philosophy, but you don't see any of this coming through in this text. Again, it, it, is, it is literally a book of lessons. I think it's a very good title um, for it because you can pick it up. You can open a page. You go, okay, here is my lesson for today. It's an absolute dream for an instructor and a complete nightmare um, if you're trying to interpret some sort of system from it. And I think, again, that's, that's an interesting question. Do we, do we want to interpret a system? Are we really trying to see that there is something coherent that we can apply to a, a wider culture? Or you know, what, what, what can we do with it? What is the limitations on, on this? Thank do you, you see the plays that are in here um, as lining up with uh, like any other particular um, author's plays? Um, or it's just here and there, no. the normal thing you would do in fencing, and that's about I, it. I think there are times when I feel, gosh, you know, this is, this, this feels quite close. Um, there are times where I've played with it where, um, and I, I, I am a, a fence with limitations. I certainly would not put myself up with, with, um, Tan or Francesco later in those best, or, or, or you would use yourself, but, um, there are times I've done, let's say, a deeper Italian stance, if you want to call it that, more linear. That's worked fine. And then at other times, in other parts of the book is kind of like, ah, no, I need to be a little more upright. Am I going to be more Bolognese, for example? I don't know. Um, that may well be reflective of my limitations as a fencer, or it's just that it's so open to interpretation. 
So speaking of interpretation, you mentioned that you um, you really enjoy teaching. So um, with the difficulty in interpreting this book, I, I was curious if you could talk about, are, are, you, are you teaching from this text? And what was your experience bringing that into physical manifestation and the choices that you've made? Um, especially how, how are your students um, being able to realize it? Um, I would say if you want to go and teach at a workshop, it's a great book because you can you can steal a chapter and teach it. And it is, um, uh, I don't want to call it bland, but it's, it's really quite open. You can apply it. I would say that in every one of my workshops, I ask for students to disagree with me. Um, as long as it is in a non-Facebook type argument, I, people should be able to, to push back. And I think if they have, you know, if people have other interpretations, great, because that's how we grow. Um, I fence in a particular style. Um, I, you know, the, the clubs that I have been taught by has done a Bolognese style, and naturally that impacts on my own particular fencing. Um, so therefore I would say that comes out. But again, I think that's part of the thing that I try and say to my students is look, you know, at the end of the day, you are going to pick up something, you will develop your own style. You will have your fundamentals, they are remote mechanical fundamentals, and I can try and infer something and point you down the road, but it, it is open for this. I hope I'm approaching something like the pictures, so I have a reference there, but I'm not trying to be dogmatic on it. I, I just think that's that's far too dangerous. And again, I, I think this is where we get in some, we can sometimes get into unnecessary arguments about who is right and who is wrong. You can say when something's bad fencing, you can say when something's good fencing, but when it comes into interpretation, I think it, it's nice to have a little bit of gestation and then a little bit of mixing with people to try and bring that up. I mean, you've mentioned Tom, um, before and, and you mentioned in, in the introduction to him about how he's helped reinterpret and what you can do with certain forms of fencing and that, that that's that's the only way I think one can go. Yeah, I think it's a really healthy attitude as well. Um, we, certainly we're not going to have the same level of growth without a community challenging our ideas. Uh, we have another question from the chat. Um, if you were to make another edition of your translation right now, even though it's only been three years, is there any other additional information or conclusions you would add uh, due to what you've learned since then? Is it, I don't know if that's Rivera fishing for something or Chris Lee. Um, it's Rivera. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Um, okay, I was about to say an anecdote then, but I'm not going to. Um, well, I would hope that I'd be a little more coherent than I've been in this discussion, because I'm not sure I've actually uh, gone through the treatise clear enough. Um, I would have to do some corrections. So the Caval Cabo, I originally thought it was 5097. Earlier edition has come out from 5095. I would probably want to revisit the whole text um, and just, just go through some of the things again. Maybe if I've had some more experience in workshops. Um, some of the, the sword and dagger stuff I might want to revisit and clarify. I wouldn't necessarily correct the text, but I might want to put in a few more footnotes. I What I'm hoping to do in my thesis is, I'm, I'm obviously looking at the influence of Caval Cabo, and if I've been too heavy on him, I, I apologize. But this, this guy is basically ignored today, but was really famous in the day, and then kind of stops dead at 1628. There's, there's this lack of interest. I want to know, did he have more in influence in this book? Or is there more evidence for what this person is doing? And I, I mentioned Marie de Medici and the French exiles that are out there. If this book does come from Brussels the, the, or the, the Spanish Netherlands, it is, it is germinating in a massive bubbling court of dueling and fencing. There's a lot of stuff going on there and you have a lot of cultures there. You've got the French there, you've got Italians there in a lot of force, and of course you've got the Spanish and the Dutch. We only need to look at 1628, you know, 1630, um, Thibaut Danver. You know, he, he's coming in there and he's doing something and in his explanation 
uh, uh, or in his biography, we know that he's fencing other masters who are going, okay, I'm a bit unsure about this, but, you know, he's then accepted. So there is a tradition, there is a cultural milieu there, the fencing, and, and maybe, and this is where I'm going out on a limb, maybe there's something in that with this book. Maybe you've got someone who's attempting to codify and synthesize and bring it together. And, and I do believe it is a, a, um, um, a, a teaching text. I would also say that, you know, I'm looking at the, the gorgeous purple of this color. These inks cost a lot of money. They are, the penciling is corrected. Um, it's folio edition, so it's quite large size. And then you have later one that's in, as I say, is in the Scott collection, um, which is, is slightly better drawn, very slightly better drawn. And again, a lot of inks um, uh, going on this. And the, the white on here isn't chalk, this is paint as well. So there's, there's a lot of layering going on here. I think um, you know, there's expense. I wonder if this is more high status than a captain of horse. Now, of course, you know, Carranza was similarly originally, I think he was a captain of horse and then he became, you know, he, he ascended. So maybe this person had connections, but there just isn't the evidence for someone called Rerethia who seems to be that, that high up. But evidence at that time is pretty poor, pretty poor. Um, the other thing I would like to do is, um, of course, actually publish the whole of the original text, um, the pictures of it, and, and the, uh, the Scott Collection one. Unfortunately, the, the Scott Collection um, charges an awful lot, way out of our range. Um, and um, it, it's just, there are certain difficulties with dealing with them in, in trying to get this out, because I would like to publish um, a, a complete edition. Um, not, not just for getting money, because uh, I, I can promise you, I don't, I don't make a living out of this one book. Um, but it would be lovely to see that out there, because uh, they are gorgeous. Um, Rob, you've talked uh, a lot about the the context uh, of the the work as much as um, the actual technical parts of it. What can you tell us about? The, uh, the grappling that's in it, um, both from a technical and a context perspective, keeping in mind okay. what you think the audience is. So the, the grappling is quite interesting. Um, so you actually see grappling with sword and dagger as well. You see a couple of throws. They're generally sweeps. Um, the, the single sword is generally more of a disarm, in a way like a movement to conclusion. Um, so you, you do see that coming through. And then you see the, the grappling in terms of the dagger is generally using some form of arm lock, using the pommel to, to force the um, blade back towards the opponent or to flip the dagger out. So sweeps and locks and disarms. It is not a wrestling one. This is where um, I, 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 I'm very cautious about saying this. Um, I, I don't think Sidney Anglo really did the book justice when he talks about it in the, the martial arts of Renaissance um, Europe. He, he talks about it being a Spanish text. We don't know it's a Spanish text. He talks about Spanish wrestling. It's not wrestling. There's, there's just not the depth there. Sidney Anglo did not have a lot of nice things to say about Spanish fencing in general. Um, I would say, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's interesting because uh, for, me, the, for me, the book is very useful in terms that it, it's putting across, this is the martial arts Renaissance Europe, is trying to put across an awful lot of um, problems. It's trying to highlight them. I think, you know, we hadn't had, um, you hadn't quite hit the seed, I think is probably a way of putting it, but, you know, the, 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 the Spanish, revolution hadn't quite happened over the last 20 years um, uh, at that point. Um, I would be interested to see what happens now. I am interested in where he's trying to um, put fencing in with dancing, um, but I would say that his inferences are more correlation than causation. The direct evidence of 
one actually teaching the other or directly impacting the other is actually quite slight. Uh, there's obviously some under Catherine de' Medici during um, her regency and that, but that's Italian's um, inferences on what he does uh, with uh, Thibaut Danva. And indeed with this, are particularly slight. This this is a fighting manual, really. We don't, um, whilst it's elegant in some ways, um, I wouldn't say that it's, as we talked earlier, something we talked about sound or anything like that. And there's certainly no wrestling. So um, speaking about some of Mary's, uh, Dr. Curtis's work, um, the smarter the two of us, she talked about uh, in her dissertation, fencing as a performance of masculinity within the culture. And looking at these plates, um, I, I'm spitballing here, but to me, this looks like um, like upwardly mobile or upper class gentlemen doing a civilian art. Have you placed um, this text within the class in the context of um, like elite masculinity of the age? In terms of elite masculinity, no. Uh, masculinity, I would say, I've, I've looked at it from the French perspective, but I, I think that would be misleading to talk about here. Um, I would say that the clothes indicated are, let's say, upwardly mobile. Hence my, you know, when we talk about Captain Brabham actually writing this, one, you know, really, there's, there's a lot of influ inference from this. However, you know, if you're producing a text, is this a text of what you're aspiring to be rather than necessarily a reflection of what you are? So I, I, again, I think one has to be um, quite careful on this. I have wondered whether this is to teach younger fences um, because it's fairly large plates. I, again, I've alluded to, I believe, I've got no evidence. I believe this is demonstrative to people. And as I say, if you're standing in the south and you want to demonstrate something, you have a nice picture, it would be useful for a younger audience. And again, may explain why the blood is removed in the later plates, um, except for, as we say, you know, the, the, the assassin, they get their just desserts. And again, assassin is my inference. It doesn't actually talk about an assassin, but you're talking about fighting somebody who attacks you with a dagger. So the, the inference is, is fairly strong. Also, one hell of a question, Puck. Sorry, I, <laughs> we, you can't really talk about Carranza without looking at some of those questions. Um, he's an interesting dude. Yeah, I, 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 I think so. I mean, if we're going to say, is this actually deriving from some sort of French form of fencing? That, that's very interesting because Francois Doncy in 1623 is showing a lot of these techniques and he actually rejects a lot of the um, stuff that Agrippa talks about. Um, he actually, in this passage, he, he rather sarcastically um, has a go at the Spanish and the Italians and the French um, in, in terms of, of, of how they act uh, and so on. And one can see some parallels, some broad parallels in this text with some of the stuff that Dance is in, in that it's um, a fighting. But again, I, I would really hate to take this too far. Um, I think it's, um, I think it is not a text where we can read too much into on that front. It is essentially dealing with someone is doing this, you respond with this, and here are the variations. There are some general parts, as I said at the beginning, that talk of principles, but again, you're not really saying too much. Um, I would say that some modern historians have made a lot of infer inferences on the Caval Cabot side by saying, uh, so Caval Cabot do, says, do, do as you, you, you judge fit. Um, and he always talks about waiting is better. Now, a lot of modern historians have really taken this out as a whole philosophy and they've equated it with, um, there's a chap called Pluvenel, who I don't know if you know, but he was the, the horse master of uh, Louis XIII and he wrote a giant book on how people should be taught. And they've, they've taken this sort of very slim fencing manual and ascribed it to Pluvenel. And one, one can 
one can start to quite merrily trip down the road here of, of finding philosophy. It's a really bad thing to do, I feel. We, we, we again have to step back and say, what can we say? And really be clear about the rest is inference. So I, I really, I would really be very cautious about this. You know, is this a dueling text, for example? Well, again, the, you know, what is the purpose of fencing in general on this? Um, the techniques are really quite clear. This is what you do. The original plates show an awful lot of running through. So there is violence that is implied, it is implicit. It's maybe then sanitized in the later place. So again, we, we, we have to take care um, on, on these. So you said, um, I think I heard you right, waiting is better as a, a maxim? Yes. Uh, and could you restate the source for that for me again? That's for Girolamo Cavalcavo, gotcha. 1595. There is a, a treatise of his, which is in the BNF, it's online, um, Bibliothèque Nationale Française, um, which is uh, in the original Italian. Uh, it's a fairly low res scan but online and it, it's on there. Um, I would say that um, the French translation is, is something of a wrap around the original Italian, but it doesn't really change much um, from there. I have actually got an English translation of Cabal Cabal out, um, which is a little bit old and probably could do with some updating. So is that specifically in the context of fencing, they're talking about like, it's better to be the receiver than the attacker? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he doesn't, an awful lot of your opponent does this and you respond. And again, if you remember what we're doing about the mathematical form, um, you're saying the counter to the mathematical form. So we have uh, this really interesting piece of Carranza where he's, he imports uh, the rules of rhetoric into fencing from philosophical, philosophy and dialogues. And um, he specifically says that um, to lie in wait is better. I'll see if I can find that specific piece mm. and get it sent to you. I'd be interested. I think I think there are, I mean, we may be going down some of a rabbit hole here. I am very interested in the use of humanism in um, fencing texts. I mean, certainly you get uh, all the classical illusions that are thrown in. I mean, gosh, the histories of um, Palavicini and in the beginning of uh, Marcelli, you know, they, they've got all the classical illusions, that's somewhat later. But um, the implicit humanism that, that comes through as well. And again, we've got to recognise that humanism isn't just a, a, a fad. This is actually, it's um, uh, a lot of, I suppose we could call it high school education, so pre-university. We're seeing a lot of humanism going in there, a bit more resistance in the, um, in the university areas. But it is filtering through and it comes through in the text and i do feel that um a lot of the texts that that are being produced at the time you know they are tailoring for a particular audience and they're going to have some of that in there now that may be doing an injustice because they're obviously trying to teach fencing and we don't want to diminish the science they're trying to put across but nonetheless you have a particular way of phrasing things that you wish to convey in order to, to get your audience's attention. Yeah. Um, another question from the chat, um, looking for um, distilling um, ideas from the text. So the question is, in practicing and analyzing these plays, have you been able to determine some fundamental principles that are common to most of the selected plays or does there not appear to be a rhyme or reason and the fencing is pulled from a lot of different sources? Crikey, you're not pulling punches tonight. Um, it, yeah, it really does depend. I think um, um, I go through phases on this. I would say that at times I think there is something really co coherent about it. And I'm just, just, you know, starting to see something. And then I just later think, what on earth is he on about? Um, we've got the usual problems that face any fencer of when he talks about inside and outside. Um, do we know whether he's talking about you, the other fencer, someone who just happened to walk in the room at the time? It, it's really, you know, gets very, very 
tricky. Um, it's, 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 it's almost like student notes written at speed. You know, I kind of, I know what I mean when I read it later type thing. Um, that's great for interpretation. Um, I would say that um, where I struggle on this is some of the mechanics are a little bit obscure. Again, let, let's take this as limitations on my fencing. Um, he does use the lunge, so you'll see an extended movement, probably not too deep, but then you also see a lot of passing footwork. And some of the passing footwork um, doesn't quite sit well with some of the lunging, if that makes sense. So you've got this somewhat extended form, and then suddenly you see a passing or a walking to the outside. My inference on the walking to the outside there, and it, it, it's, it's like, okay, my, my body is starting to move around in a slightly um, conflicting way. The way in which the text is set out as well, does you do get lessons of the single sword, then mathematical form, and then you get these odd sections afterwards, which is kind of like, okay, I'm gonna talk about the, the, the lessons of the single sword again. Um, there's a little bit of jumping about, same with the sword and dagger. And it's difficult because there's this gloss, as I said over the top, we're talking in brocade and brocade on it, to see whether there's several sources underneath or whether it's the distillation of thoughts. We don't have, I've mentioned you know, Saviola 1595, we don't have an explicit statement of, I've drawn from lots of different masters. Um, and even the Cavalcabo and the, the Paternostria part does not state them. It, it's just, you, it was uh, known, you know, someone back in the day, so oh, hold on, this is Cavalcabo, I noticed it, and then with a little bit more research, we can say, it's earliest 1595 because it's got Pattern Austria. So they're not saying anything about the authorship. It's, um, I'm going to take a punt on this, as you've been so kind. I'd say it's three quarters there to a coherent system, but there are bits that are tripping over. And other fences may well disagree with me on that. That's really fascinating. Um, so let's, um, we're, we're almost out of time, so we, we are hitting our uh, our 90 minute mark for the lecture proper. Um, if you have questions, uh, let's get our last ones in on the chat. Silence. I want to know a good tailor that can make fencing clothes that look like that. Oh, you want high heel pants? Uh, these, the guy who tailored my jacket did Tom's jacket. High heel pants does them uh, in Galicia, uh, in A Coruña. So hmm. you can look them up on Facebook or on the web. Um, and uh, Jose Castro, um, who is an absolutely fabulous guy. Oh, okay. Um, I've been told that we're supposed to figure out a way to ask you the, the trolling question about a commitment though. Um, so but let's, let's make it fair. Um, All right. so, um, can you talk about the role of faints and mut mutating attacks in this text a little bit? <laughs> okay. He does use a lot of faints, certainly. Um, uh, he does use a lot of what I would say compound attacks. So there is an attempt of deception. I don't think that would sit very well with some Spanish authors, um, but there is certainly an attempt to engage the sword, get them to move in a certain direction, and then, uh, you know, do the, the classic fainting thing, disengage and hit them. Uh, I don't know if that answers your, your question at all. Yeah, I think it does. Um, we we have sort of a debate as to whether fainting is good distress or not. Um, so it's good distress as long as you change the name uh, to something else. Yeah, I don't. I don't think um, our, our chap, if it is De Heretio, is, is is interested in that. He he wants to finish this off. He wants to get to it. 
Um, he has got a number of nasty tricks as well. Um, so as I said, you've got, I think it's the, the Toniada, um, you've, um, or something I've in, in, interpreted as it. Uh, there's an awful lot of um, passing and stabbing with the dagger, um, which is immense fun. Uh, so, you know, he, he's, he's, he's not a gentleman. Well, that's lovely. Um, we do have one more question from the chat. Um, as far as the hand that writes the text, is it a single um, writer or do we know that there are different uh, people writing the script? That's a very good point. There is a, for the main text, it is a single hand. However, there is quite a heavy handed Gothic style script or Germanic style script, I haven't getting my terms right, which is used for titles that may have been added later. Also, the, there is some variation in the hand on the plates. The plates refer to the text. The text never refers to the plates. I don't know if I mentioned that earlier. So whatever's happening, the text in whatever form is codified, is, is put together first, then the plates are made. But I don't know whether the later, if, whether the text is then rewritten in a good form, but there seems to be a later hand putting in these titles. As I say, I mean, my, my theory is, is that this is developed over a number of years. This is either several fences or it's a fences journey, you know, and I, um, if, if we are coming to an end, um, firstly, I need to apologize if I've been somewhat incoherent and trying to explain the, the text, I do apologize for that. Um, what I would say is, is for me, this treatise is a journey through time. It, it's, it's compiled over time. It takes techniques that are gathered over time. It has a number of influences. It has a number of different languages filtering in. We can't just say, we can't, you know, some people dismissed it. It's not Distreza, it's not Spanish. Some people said, it's a vulgar Distreza. Some people said, well, it's written in French. It must be French. We, we can't make these assumptions. We just simply don't know what the decisions are at the time when people are doing this. This is a personal work and this never reached, I think, the conclusion to be disseminated. Um, what it says to me is when we pick up a text now, we should always be aware, A, if it's reprinted over a number of years, and we should always consider what the people of that time in those reprints think, or indeed people who just had an old copy, because their approach to it is not going to be as a reenactor to recreate the fencing. This is a part of their everyday life. It's very important for them at that time. And they're gonna put it in their time, in their context and use it as use for them. They're not gonna be doing what we're doing now, which is trying to recreate an old form. So my appeal as, as well as you know, looking at context, as well as don't be zealous, is remember these things have a time span and you cannot drop into a particular time like a Hollywood picture and just assume that everything is, is of that particular epoch and got to be precisely in that period. Well, thank you so much for that summary. I, that was really interesting. And uh, I just have to say, I, I really appreciate the work that you have done to bring this text to us. Um, some of these texts, like you say, were never published and so um, the first time there's a wide exposure to it, um, you're part of the history of that text and you bring it to us. So I really appreciate all that work. Um, and thank you so much. His room is quite bright, but it is like the dark of night there. So he is staying up very late to speak to us. Um, so just thank you so much for sharing your expertise, your time and your energy uh, for this lecture series. Well, thank you very much for your time and uh, apologies for the rambles. Um, and I'm, I'm just very delighted to meet people who share a passion. Um, and just best of luck this series because it's, it's bringing so much good. Thank you for that. Well, thank you so much. And oh, as far as I'm concerned, you're just taking us down the little back alleys and showing us the colorful bits. Um, so two weeks from tonight, we will have uh, Tim Rivera uh, with his second lecture and he's gonna talk to us about some of the research he's been doing recently. Um, so we'll take a break for a week uh, and in two weeks we'll meet again.